Hi everybody, welcome back. So today is going to be the last lecture in the module on epidemic dynamics. And we're going to see how to relate the microscopic, stochastic or random probabilistic models that we've been looking at, how to relate those to a more macroscopic description. So the, the point is that often what we want to know is how many individuals are people are infectious at a given time. That's really all we care about. We don't necessarily want to know exactly which individual is infectious, just in total how many people are infectious. And so we want a sort of macroscopic description, a global picture of what's going on with the epidemic. And so that's what we're going to try and do today is see how if we start from the kind of microscopic stochastic models where we really model each individual an agent-based description like we've been doing in the homeworks, how can we go from that towards this global picture? And the, the goal is to produce a picture like this. So you've seen pictures like this already. Where did they come? Where did they arise? Well, we did a stochastic simulation of the SIR agent-based model, and then we took averages. And so the average uh, or the mean of those, when we average over lots of different simulations, we get these kind of smooth curves that look like this. And that's what we're aiming to model to find an easier way to uh, describe those curves with equations uh, in the simpler equations in this, in this lecture. Okay, so to start off, we're gonna go back to the simple model of recovery that we started with in, in the homework. So we'll just have infectious individuals I, and they can transition to being recovered with some probability, which we'll call P. So each day, each individual can recover with a probability P, just like in the homework. And we have n total people, which are all infected at time zero. So let's just draw that to start with. So <clears throat> start, I'll, I'm drawing infected individuals at the top here. And um, so these are the infectious at height one. And then as I move time, some of these people will start to recover. And recovered individuals will be shown down here. And so what you studied in, in the homework is how long does it actually take one particular individual to recover? That's a random variable with a particular distribution. Now we're saying if we have many of those individuals, we want to sum up, we want to just count the numbers which are infectious at a given time and the numbers which have already recovered. So I've put those numbers on this picture as well. So as the, um, as the time moves on, we see that more and more in, in individuals are recovering at random and so the number of infectious individuals goes down and the number of recovered people goes up. And, you know, uh, over time, uh, and people cannot go back from recovered to infectious in this simple model. And so um, we have a monotonic function. So what we're going to do is just, you know, draw that function. So here's a picture of two runs of that simulation. We start with 200 people in each run, and then we just do this dynamics where each person with probability P recovers at each time step. And so what we're seeing is exactly the number of people which are infectious still at time, for example, 25. In the first run, there are about 70 people who are still infectious. In the other run, there are about 60. Uh, but you can see they sort of swap over and then maybe I can just run the simulation again and we'll see different curves and each time we'll see a different curve, but they all the curves kind of look similar. So let's um, okay, so what we're going to do is plot a lot of those curves all together, and that looks like this. And, and so we can see that, well, they all have the same kind of shape or tendency, uh, but there's, of course, some variation because we have a stochastic process, a random dynamics. So by the way, there's an interesting piece of Julia here, which is, how do I actually do the simulation? So I have this function step, which just goes through the, all of the people in the list of individuals, and checks, are they still infectious and, and makes them recover. So you've already basically written that function. But the interesting thing here is that I want to count the number of people who are still infectious using this count function. And then I want to add that information in to an array. And that array, which I'm calling num infectious, starts off as just a single element array. So we just have one item in the array to start with. And then we're going to add new elements with this push bang function. So remember the bang modifies its argument, first argument. So it's actually modifying this array by adding or appending this element, uh, this number onto the end of the array. This is a very common thing to do in Julia. Use this 
Uh, start off with an empty array or a one element array and then just add all the data as you generate it. And the advantage of this is that if you don't know how many data you're going to be including, uh, this is uh, a good way of actually writing the simulation. And you might worry that push is going to be inefficient because it's allocating new memory all the time, but actually it does it in a clever way uh, that we won't go into. Basically, it doubles the length of the array uh, when it needs to. And so that means that it's almost free to do this as long as uh, we're not going to go into the details, but it's, it's, it's very cheap to do this and it's a very common thing to do in Julia. Okay, so let's go back. And so we have this <clears throat> set of runs. So we're doing experiments. Each experiment gives me one of these curves, one of these monotonically decaying curves, which is the number of infectious people at time t. And now what is a natural thing to do is to look at this and say, well, what is the kind of shape of that function, right? We're doing some kind of computational thinking, exploratory data analysis. We're, we're just looking at this graph and it, what it's crying out to do, for us to do is sort of take the mean of all of these curves. And that's what you've already done in the homeworks. And we get this kind of picture. So the red dots are the mean. And as we, um, and then if I you know, run it again, I'll get a very similar curve for the mean. It's almost be slightly different, but uh, the amount of variation in the mean curve is going to be much less than in the individual curves. So if you look at this curve, it looks like a pretty nice smooth function. And we could think that maybe there's a, a, an easier way to calculate this function than just doing the stochastic simulation and running a lot of times and then taking the mean. So um, if we look at this curve again, what do we think the dynamics is actually doing? Well, it seems to be, de it's obviously decaying in some way. So we have to guess what that function is. And you might guess, for example, that it's like one over x squared or something, but um, you also might guess that it's exponential. So often when you guess that something is exponential, you're not actually right. So you, you have to check. And we've seen that one way to check that is to actually plot the y-axis on a logarithmic scale. So that's what I've done here. Just um, the same, exactly the same data. And indeed what we see is a, that the mean is now approximately a straight line on this semi-log plot. And we've seen that that means that the data is exponentially decaying with some rate. That's the slope of this line. Okay, so can we actually derive that? Can we derive this exponential decay? So what we're going to try and do is say, how does the mean number of individuals? So again, the mean is averaging over the different runs of the simulation. So if we had an infinite number of runs, we might expect that the variance uh, goes down well, so when we average over an infinite number of runs, we, we should get a sort of perfect exponential decay here. So can we derive that? So let's call i sub t the number of infectious people at time t. That's what we're interested in. And well, it's going to be the mean number of people in this stochastic simulation. And so this is going to decrease at each time step because some people recover. And so how we want to know how many people recover. So each person recovers with probability p and there are i sub t numbers of a number of people in this moment, then on average, we expect to have p multiplied by i sub t people recover. So this is, you know, a probabilistic argument. It's not clear if this is rigorous or, or what. Uh, we'll come back to that in a minute. But this is at least a, an, a, an intuitive idea that approximately p times i t, a fraction p of all of the people will recover because that's what it means for them to recover with probability p, or you can think about generating the random numbers, how, what proportion of people will recover, it's approximately p i t. And so the number that will be left after one step is, you know, so the, the number at the next time step, i sub t plus one, is gonna be the number that are present currently minus the number that recover, p sub i t, p times i sub t. And so we can rewrite this as, you know, i t plus one equals i t multiplied by one minus p. And then we see that what we actually have is basically a geometric decay. Uh, geometric sequence, you could call it. It's not a series. We're not adding anything. We're just multiplying the previous one by, uh, by a common factor. And so um, another way of writing that would be that the change in i t, which is, you know, the value of the next step minus the value of the current step is minus p times i t. And that's the way that we'll actually use later on. But now we can actually take, so this is called a recurrence relation or a, disc, uh, uh, or a um, difference equation uh, because it tells me what the difference of this uh, over time is. 
and we want to be able to solve this in order to actually, you know, this is giving me the value at the next time step in, the, in terms of the previous time step. And now we want to solve it to get the value of i t sub t as a function of t. And so we can actually do that by uh, mathematical induction. And hopefully uh, it's reasonably clear that we should just be multiplying this factor 1 minus p to the power t, the number of time steps. And that gives me an explicit formula and tells me exactly what this, how this decay happens is this factor one minus p, where p is the recovery probability. So basically a fraction one minus p do not recover and so they're still infectious. And so at each time step that happens and, and that's the result. And so we can compare that exact analytical result with the numerics, with the, 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 some, you know, the mean of the data from one particular run of 30 simulations and we get this comparison and you can see that indeed the mean is following pretty much, not exactly, but very close to that analytical expression. If we took more and more data, we would expect the mean, the numerical mean to become closer and closer to that analytical exact result. So how do we know that this is an exact result? Well, we can actually derive it in a different way uh, using starting from the, really the microscopic dynamics that we've been doing in the homework. So let's call X, capital X sub T uh, with a superscript I, that's going to be the value of the ith person at time T. And so that's either going to be one if they're infected or zero if they have recovered, if, they're, if they have already recovered by time T. And so that's what we're actually plotting in that um, visualization up here, right? So um, on the X axis, I have I, and on the Y axis, I have uh, x i sub t so i can actually label those axes which we should already always do right we should always label the axes because otherwise nobody who's looking at the picture actually really understands what's going on so this is going to be x sub i um at time t and let's call that x sub i of of t because i uh right now i don't remember how exactly to put latex labels but you can put la labels using latex uh and so that's what we're, we're we're showing the value of you know this is like individual number 70 or something uh, currently, at this time, they, are, they have the value 1. At some point in the future, they'll actually decay. Let's watch that. At, there's some time when suddenly they'll decay, and from all future times, the, that value will be 0. So that's what x sub, I, uh, x sub t i is. And now we're going to write an equation for how that evolves in time. So the value of the person at time t plus 1 is going to be 0, when, when is it so recovered? When is it going to be recovered? It's either going to be recovered if it was already recovered at the previous time step, or it was infectious at the previous time step, but then a Boolean random variable, a coin flip, was one. And that means that, you know, that, that person recovered with probability p at that time step. And otherwise, it stays at one. And so that is a, you know, reasonably concise description of this dynamics. But we can write it in this even shorter form using the fact that because we have Boolean variables that are either 0 or 1, 1 minus that Boolean variable is the opposite value. So it's, it's, it's 1 if the Boolean value is 0 and it's 0 if the Boolean value is 1. Okay, so we've got this formula that tells us how this dynamics goes along. And so now what we're going to do is take means of this. And so I'm going to denote that by these triangle brackets, which is often used in physics, this notation. In probability theory, this would be called taking the expectation or expected value. And it's often written with this bold, uh, blackboard bold E of X. So it just means the mean of this quantity, you know, you can think of uh, running this simulation many times and taking the mean, or you can think of sort of more theoretically, there's some population and we're taking the, the, the mean of that. And so we need to take means of both sides of this equation. And here it is. The mean of x at time t plus 1 is uh, x at time t times 1 minus the mean of this Boolean random variable. And here what I've used is that the mean or expectation of a product of two random variables, this is literally you know, this times this. These are just numbers, right? 0 or 1. Uh, and <clears throat> so the mean of a product is actually the product of the means of the random variables provided they're independent. And because the coin flips are independent of anything else, uh, these Bernoulli random variables are the coin flips, that means that um, you know, we're, we're okay, they're independent, we can factor this thing. And then the total number of infectious people at time t is the sum of 
all of these random variables at time t. Why? Because they're either zero if they're recovered or one if they're infectious. And so the sum of those zeros and ones exactly gives me the number of people. And then I'm taking the mean of that. And so once you put all of this together, uh, so you sum both sides over i, and you'll get exactly that this mean number i at time t plus 1 is equal to exactly 1 minus p times the mean at time t, just as we had before from the intuitive idea. But this is a very useful way of thinking about things because um, it, it really helps get things much more precise. Uh, you know, you get there are factors of n coming up that, that will need to get precise and this is a good way of doing it. Okay, so, so now we have a macroscopic description uh, we, but in discrete time, right? So this is, we're taking time steps of size one. Each day we're saying how many people have recovered. But we could also try and reduce the time steps and say, well, maybe I want to think about hours in one hour or in one minute, how many people recover. And of course, um, it'll be much fewer, right? Much fewer people will recover after one minute than after one day. And so uh, what we'll want to do is take a time step delta t, like one minute, and say, what is the probability to recover in that amount of time? And it turns out that the right way to model that is just to make the probability to recover in time delta t, that I'm calling p, function of delta t. That is going to be some parameter number lambda multiplied by the length of the time interval delta t. It turns out that that's the correct thing to do. It's not necessarily that obvious, in my opinion. Uh, and so what kind of object is lambda? It's actually a probability divided by, if I, if I take delta t over the other side, it's a probability divided by delta t. So it's a probability per unit time, and that's what we call a rate. So it's very uh, important to distinguish in your head what is a rate and what is a probability. A rate is when you have something per unit time. And so when we do that and we you know, follow through the same uh, process as we did before, but now instead of time steps of size 1, we have time steps of size delta t. I've also changed the notation so I'm now thinking of i as a, as a function instead of a sort of value. It's a function of time now, uh, instead of just indexed by these times uh, subscripts. Uh, then I get i at t plus delta t minus i at t. That's the change in the number of infectious people over this time step of size delta t is actually given by minus this lambda times delta t uh, multiplied by the current value of i. So that was what was p times i before is now this thing. And so if I divide through by delta t, I get this value on the left, which you will recognize as a derivative. It's a derivative when I take the limit as delta t goes to zero. So when I take the limit, what we, what we call the continuous limit, where I'm taking shorter and shorter steps with fewer and fewer things happening in each of those short steps, but overall the same number of things happening over a long time. That's called the continuous limit. And it's a pretty you know, slippery thing to define precisely and to make rigorous, but intuitively it's what we've just done. And so when I take the limit uh, as delta t goes to zero, I, I get this equation, right? I get the derivative of i on the left, uh, derivative in the sense of calculus, and equals minus lambda times i. So what do I have, have here? I have an equation that relates the derivative of the function i to itself. Uh, so that is an ordinary differential equation. Uh, but it's really just kind of the same as this discrete description that we had up, up, up here. So, you know, um, often we make a lot of fuss in our heads between trying to distinguish between discrete descriptions and continuous versions. But actually, they're kind of the same. And we should, we should think of them as, as, as being very related, very similar, and you can, should be able to pass from one to the other relatively easily. So if you've taken a course on differential equations, uh, or even at high school, you'll know that the solution to this equation is a decaying exponential function with rate lambda, or uh, yeah. Uh, and okay, so that is the solution of this differential equation. And so this curve is an exponentially decaying curve. And another way of deriving that is by looking at the discrete description and replacing p by lambda delta t and then you get something like this formula with t over delta t in the numerator. And as you take delta t to zero again, you will recognize that this looks like an exponential. And that's basically the same mathematics as compound interest. Okay, so we have these three different descriptions of this recovery process, which is stochastic, 
model might at a microscopic scale with individuals or agents doing something and that's a useful description where when we want to really you know give rules of behavior for individuals and then if we're lucky we can do this averaging process to get a dis macroscopic description which is a global description of the whole system and in particular we'll in this in this case we know how many in infectious individuals are there at time t and then we can pass to this continuous time representation uh, as a differential equation. And that's useful because that might give us more analytical tools to actually solve or understand the dynamics of these equations. On the other hand, if we want to solve this equation numerically, what we will probably end up doing is going straight back to some kind of discretized version like this, where we do little time steps. And we'll be actually going into that in more detail in the next module of the course. So finally, to finish, uh, let's go back to the full SIR model. So we have susceptible in individuals who can transition to become infected by contact with other people who are already infectious, and then recovery that we've just talked about. So let's S, capital S T now be the number of susceptible people. And we want to, 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 to understand how uh, do those, how does the number of infectious people now change? It changes when infectious people contact or touch susceptible people. And so if we think about the model that we did in homework, we have each infectious person is choosing one person from the population to interact with. Okay, so there are n people, you can think of them sort of, I don't know, in a circle, and you just sort of point to one of them and say, I want to interact with you. Are you infectious? Or, are, sorry, are you susceptible? And they'll tell you yes or no. And so what is the probability that they tell you, yes, they are susceptible? Well, it's just count the number of susceptible people and divide by the total number of people that you're choosing from. So we get this ratio ST over N is the probability that that individual that you choose will be, in, will be susceptible at that particular moment. And then if the infection is successful, well, that's going to, you know, then you choose, you try to infect them, but you are only successful in infecting them with some probability. So we'll call that probability B. And so the total number of people that get infected newly, newly infected at time T is actually given by this product. B, the rate, you know, the probability of infection times the total number of people that are currently infected times this probability that each of those people chooses a susceptible person. So this is an approximation uh, because they can't all infect the same individual, for example. So we are making an approximation here. And again, you can do a, disc a, 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 a version of this argument starting from the discrete dynamics, the stochastic dynamics, with these random variables, capital X, just like we did before. So I'll leave that as an exercise. And then you can try and work out if this approximation is correct or not. Okay, so uh, because the, this divided by N occurs in the equation, it's actually useful to normalize these variables. So little st is actually now gonna be the fraction or the proportion of people in the population that are susceptible. And same for little it and, and little rt. And when we go through this, uh, same idea as before, and then we add in recovery, we actually get this discrete time SIR model. So, you know, the number of susceptible people at time t plus one is the number that, that were there before minus the number that transitioned from susceptible to infected, which is given by this product, B times the number of susceptibles, sorry, the fraction, the proportion of susceptibles times the proportion of infectious people. So that is a discrete time SIR model, and that's what I was simulated here. So it's, you know, it's, it's now much easier to simulate this um, in a, on a computer than it is to do those stochastic simulations. But it's much harder to understand where this model comes from, in my opinion. And so you have this sort of dichotomy between what's easy to simulate, uh, but, but, but time consuming versus what's harder to understand, but easier to, to actually simulate, right? And finally, um, we can do the same continuous limit, continuum limit where we say instead of time steps of size one, I want time steps of size delta t, and then take the limit as delta t goes to zero. And what we get is the change, you know, so I take st over to this side, I get st plus one minus st, that's the change in st. And that's what this derivative really is, right? Except that we have to divide by this delta t and take the limit. And so we have the change in s of t is given by this rate now. So again, um, we'll have b times delta t in the new version. And that's what, so instead of b, we'll, we'll, we'll use beta. And this, these are 
the equations that you'll see if you look up the SIR model uh, on the internet and that you've probably seen in many simulations over the last few months of the pandemic. And so just to comment to finish that this is, can, we can think of this as a, a model of chemical reactions actually. So uh, the particles are you know, reacting with each other and they, they have three, we have three species S, I and R and they can change to a different species uh, just like in a chemical reaction. And this, this, the fact that we have this term that looks like a product of the concentrations of two of the species is called the mass action law uh, and it's very common commonly used in chemical reaction models but it's not necessarily correct to model epidemics because the people don't actually mix in this way right so this is called a well mixed population that anybody can interact with anybody else but of course that's not really true you can only m interact with people who are physically close to you or that you have some contact with in some way if you go to hospital in the car you, you won't contact anybody along the way but you'll contact people in the, the hospital in the hospital so you'll have a sort of long range interaction and so we can model this on networks as we've already been discussing okay so um so it's a very interesting field and uh, of course th there's a lot more that you can say so for example people will split up the population into different age groups and the different age groups will interact with each other in different ways. Or as I said, you can put this on a graph or as we'll do in the next homework, you can have these people moving around in space and interacting when they actually physically collide with each other. Okay, thanks.